One of the main objections to the design inference by Darwinists is that there is no real specified complexity in biological systems. When you do the analysis, when you run uh, the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection, what seems to be improbable actually ends up not being that improbable. After the design inference, we're, my co-author, Winston Ewart, and I are going to be writing a book on conservation of information. Actually, this idea of conservation of information, we were going to deal with it in the design inference because it's a natural continuation of, uh, of the methods of design detection developed there. But it just turned out that the second edition became a huge book on its own. I mean, the original edition of the design inference was 88,000 words. This one is 180,000 words. So we're, we're at twice, twice the length already. And uh, so uh, conservation of information, it, it's, it takes a bit different approach. Uh, what, one of the main objections to the design inference by Darwinists is that there is no real specified complexity in biological systems. When you do the analysis, when you run uh, the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection, it basically acts as a probability amplifier. So what seems to be improbable actually ends up not being that improbable. And what we argue is that when you have a search strategy, like natural selection in this case, that amplifies probabilities, that very amplification of probabilities needs to be paid for with a small probability. So in a sense, they never get away from the small probabilities. It's just that they've pushed the problem deeper, okay? So you can think of it this way. Let's say you have a, an Easter egg that's hid in a large field. I mean, the field is huge, okay? It's someplace randomly put. If you are looking for that Easter egg, just doing a blind search, random search, highly improbable that you find it. If you do find it, just doing a random search, or claiming just to do a random search, we're gonna say, hey, something else was going on there. So, but let's imagine a different type of search. Uh, you start at the field and somebody has, uh, is giving you in your, um, in a, uh, your earbud, telling you, move forward, now move right, hotter, colder, hotter, hotter, colder, hotter, you're burning up. And as soon as they say you're burning up, you look down and you dig out the, 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 um, the egg. So now what, what just happened, okay? Well, you were getting information, right? And there was, there was this, this, these directions were narrowing down the search so that with high probability, you got to the egg. But now you have to ask yourself, well, those directions, you could, you could have gotten a lot of other types of directions. You could have said hotter, colder, hotter, colder, and directed the person to some corner of the field that was nowhere near the egg. Okay, so what allowed the person that was giving you those directions to give you the right directions as opposed to the wrong directions? So what you've done essentially is, it's highly improbable to find the Easter egg, but now it's highly improbable to get the instructions that will get you to the Easter egg. And so what we call that is the search for the search, and it turns out the search for the search is never easier than the search itself. And that's what conservation of information does. It says, when you get a search that with high probability finds something, you have to pay for it, and the probability that you have to pay for is actually it's at least as bad as what, what, what you were trying to overcome in the first place. And that's why we call it uh, conservation of information. In a sense, you, you can do no better than the, the improbability of the original search. And so this is a type of example that Darwinists use. Uh, Richard Dawkins made it famous with a, what he calls a myth, thinks it is like a weasel example. But if I, you know, I, I can give it to you very simply. I had a debate with Eugenie Scott, who at the time was the head of the National Center for Science Education. This was about 21 years ago with 
uh, Peter Robinson at on the campus of Stanford for um, his program, Uncommon, Descent, uh, Uncommon Knowledge, which is still in operation. And we, we raised the question of monkeys typing Shakespeare. And, you know, highly improbable. If monkeys seeming to be typing randomly come up with Hamlet's soliloquy or something like that, we're going to say, wait a second, something else was going on. So, Eugenie Scott said, yeah, but that's not how Darwinism works. What Darwinism does is you should think of the monkeys typing, but every time the monkey types a mistake, there's a lab tech behind with a vat of whiteout and whites out the mistake, okay? So that may sound plausible, but then you have to ask yourself, well, how does the lab tech know what the errors are? Errors presuppose that there's a way things are supposed to be. How does the lab tech know? And the, the whole point of this example is to explain how you get Shakespeare without Shakespeare. So that's, that's the challenge. And so what you've done is, you know, it may be highly improbable by random typing. Now it becomes more probable that, you're, that the monkeys will type Shakespeare. But the reason it's more improbable is that the lab tech knows Shakespeare in the first place. So you've never gotten a rid of the information problem. You've really deferred it elsewhere. And that's what conservation of information is about. And it really provides the complement to uh, the design inference. Design inference, in a sense, says if you've got small probability specification, you've got design. Uh, conservation of information says if you can get rid of the small probability in some ways, you've paid for it with small probability elsewhere. So it's, uh, so it's a one-two punch. Conservation of information does make an appearance in the second edition of the design inference. We treat it briefly, very briefly, in an epilogue, uh, where we also then signal that we're going to be writing a sequel uh, that will deal with this topic in depth. So that is uh, coming up, and Winston Ewart and I will be writing this uh, follow-up book together. Mm -hmm.